Welcome, my name is Wes and I am one of the co-hosts for Building Bridges uh, Virtual Book Club. So thankful for you to join us on this Monday evening. And just to, if, in case any of you are new to Building Bridges, this is just uh, our mission, our vision and our values. And real quick, we are a grassroots organization. So everyone here tonight who's helping uh, run the show, we're all volunteers from across the nation because we are a passionate about equipping relational grassroots organizers so they can support campaigns and causes based in progressive values. And values are very important to us because we recognize that the effort we all put in adds value regardless of the result, whether a candidate wins an election, whether a bill is passed or not, it doesn't matter because we got involved and we took action and that is going to make a difference sometime down the road, regardless of the results. Um, and then ultimately we exist because we want to see an engaged and informed electorate um, where everyone feels as if they value and belong. And um, that's really ultimately what we are striving here um, as Building Bridges. And we have four lenses that help kind of guide everything it, that is everything that we do. Uh, so from creating belonging to bringing about democratic reform to joining in the work towards racial equity and bridging our rural and urban communities together in everything that we do, whether it's the books we read, the movies we watch, the candidates we endorse, we wanna make sure that these four lenses are brought to the conversation. And so we'll be talking about those later tonight. So again, welcome. If you haven't had a chance, I saw in the chat that Oregon is in the house tonight, or not Oregon, Georgia. Woof. Uh, Georgia is in the house tonight. So uh, welcome to you wherever you are joining us from. So uh, we appreciate you doing that. Just a few housekeeping things to help make our night enjoyable for all. You will notice that your mics are all muted, but if you would like to contribute to our discussion this evening, please use the raise hand feature or the chat feature here in Zoom. And we just ask that you do it responsibly so that we can hear from a multitude of voices tonight. Our event is being recorded. So if that um, is an issue for you, feel free to turn off your camera and you can also rename yourself if you so choose. And then lastly, we just ask that we all give one another respect, create a culture of belonging, and have some joy tonight as we begin our discussion on Kill Switch. So if you need a refresher with Zoom, at the bottom of your screen, you should see that reactions button. Go ahead and click on that and then you can see the Zoom raise hand feature because then that lets uh, the co-host know that you would like to join in the conversation. If you are joining on your phone, um, there's what I like to call the ellipsis button or the more button. Click on that and then you should see that raise hand feature. If none of those options are working for you, you can physically raise your hand and we'll hopefully we'll spot you out or just put in the chat that, hey, I wanna talk, share something and we'll get you uh, going there. So I believe that is all I need to share right now. So I'm gonna stop sharing which is fun because now I get to see the gallery of screens. So good to see all everyone's faces tonight. And before we get uh, started, I wanted to um, give an opportunity to my fellow co-host to introduce themselves. So Jana, let's start with you tonight. Hi everybody, I'm Jana CISO and I live in the state of Nebraska, just down the road from Wes. Um, Wes is actually uh, someone I met a couple years ago when we were getting involved in primary campaigning, which I had never done before. And he encouraged me to, uh, you know, jump in and start start working on things that were intriguing me. So it has expanded to being part of the Building Bridges group and trying to. Um, you know, just connect and engage with other people who are interested in, in, in staying uh, and working to, you know, uh, 
make everything a better place. Um, lots of learning for me to do. And that's one huge reason why I keep coming. Glad to be here. Glad to see all your faces. Thanks, Jenna. I'm so glad you answered that call from a stranger uh, a year and a half ago. Um, it's been fun. Jan, uh, let's go, let's hear from Jamel and then we'll hear from Jenny real quick. Hi everybody, I'm Jamel and I am in Virginia, just outside the Beltway in Vienna, Virginia. And um, really excited about this book and I've really enjoyed book club. Um, I didn't make a call to a stranger. I just, I still do not know how I click. I clicked on something at some point and suddenly I was, um, I was enthralled by this book club. So uh, welcome everybody. Hey team, Jenny Okamoto. I'm in Carmel, Indiana, and um, I'm a volunteer grassroots organizer. I'm actually uh, work with Wes quite a bit on building bridges. Uh, so I'm kind of a guest uh, facilitator for the book club. Uh, everybody else does mo most of the lion's share work of putting together the discussion guide and all that. Uh, I work a lot on the leadership development team. So we run our programs on Thursday, our training programs. So you might've seen me uh, from some of those. If not, you're welcome to attend those. Uh, uh, and thanks for joining us tonight. I read the, for, the readings for tonight and I learned so much on each page. Uh, tried to keep my temp, my, uh, <laughs> my anger down a little bit. Uh, so I'm just looking forward to having a discussion with all of you. So thanks for coming. I appreciate you, Jana, Jamel, and Jenny for helping me out. Last year, I was a one man show and a few folks in Bridges kind of helped out and it's nice to have a team here. But I will just put a plug out there real quick. If you enjoy your experience and want to get more engaged with the book club, um, let us know because we would love to have some more hosts who maybe enjoy political reading and have more books for us. So uh, please, please, please let us know. Um, so tonight we are just focusing on chap the introduction through chapter two. All right, and so um, I did see uh, Jacqueline put a question in the chat where they're reading. Yeah, we kind of break it up for a five week period, but whether you read the book, purchased the book or nothing, you are fine because we are here to dialogue and each week we're gonna dialogue more into the book and then we'll, uh, we have some special guests that I'll announce at the end of our evening. So make sure you stay till the very end so you can know who's joining us next week. I see that Jana has put in a link for our discussion questions tonight. So if you are a visual learner, feel free to click on that link in the chat so that you can um, follow along visually. But we're ready to get started. Who's ready? Let's see those thumbs up if you're ready to get started tonight. Woohoo! awesome. Well, question number one is, and this is before we started reading, what is your view of the filibuster? How is this viewpoint shaped or formed? And I'll stress it again, before you started reading this book. And so if you would like to uh, share out loud with the whole group, um, raise that hand and we'll get you unmuted. All right, Jacqueline, I'm excited to hear from you because I think you're on Twitter and have been engaging with us. Oh, yes, I'm in Arizona, too. And I also sent six copies of this book to uh, Cinema in two of her offices and six copies to that other guy in uh, West Virginia or whatever, Ma Mansion, Mansion. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm working locally in Arizona because, of course, you know, we are in hell. <laughs> and... Um, I have been on Twitter for a while and I'm absolutely shocked really at how little I knew. So filibuster for me was, oh, a bunch of people talk too much and they shouldn't talk so much. And then when I read the conclusion of uh, the introduction and conclusion of this book, I, I mean, I, I was nauseated uh, to understand that there has been no debate in the Senate. And I don't know if I'm right or not, but I feel in Arizona, this minority rule has trickled down into local politics, some kind of mental permission that they feel that they can do that. So essentially that's it for me. Well, 
Sorry, I just took it. I have a eight months today, so sorry. That's fine. I am so glad that um, you found us on Twitter and you're passionate about this cause because it really is destroying our democracy. So appreciate it, Jacqueline. Thank you. All right, let's hear from Liz. Hi, everybody. So I, uh, I'm in Tennessee and I found you guys because the author of the book retweeted this book club. And so I don't know much about the group or anything else, but I am a political science professor at a community college in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And I had ideas about the filibuster for a very long time. Um, I'm pretty pro filibuster, honestly. And if you had asked me six months ago, I would have said, yeah, we should definitely keep it. But when this book came out and um, Adam started making the rounds of my podcast feed, and I started to hear some of the history, I thought, well, I really need to dig deeper. And so when I saw that there was a book club reading this, I was super excited because I need that accountability to, to get through books. So um, yeah, as, as Jacqueline just said, the, you know, the introduction and first couple of chapters were very enlightening. And uh, I like to think that I'm someone who is willing to change her mind uh, with new information. So. I'm, I'm experiencing a renaissance in my thoughts about the filibuster. Well, thank you uh, for sharing that. And we're so glad that you found us. And yes, Adam did retweet it because guess what? Adam's joining us on the final week of our journey through his book. So we're very excited for that. Um, and I know um, real quick, I saw in the chat, Megan just shared last year, had no idea what the filibuster was. And the more um, Megan has learned, um, it's a time waster and it prevents things from getting done. I'm a social studies teacher at the middle school level and how I was taught what the filibuster was is not what we learn uh, in Adam's book. So I, Liz, I'm in the same way where I had to reflect. And I remember back in the primary as Jana was talking, my preferred candidate in the primary wanted to get rid of the filibuster. And that was one thing that I was really like Ugh, on. And uh, so my views have changed within just the last year. So uh, hopefully you all find this enjoyable um, tonight. So um, the second question um, for our whole group discussion is, are you from a large state with a population of 10 million or more? Or are you from a smaller state with about a million or less people in your state. And based on what kind of state you come from, do you feel that your senators have a different role in representing you than do your representatives from the House? So kind of a population geography question, and then also um, how does that affect your view on your senator versus your representative? And go ahead and raise their hand. Awesome, Myra, we'll get you unmuted. So I, I'm from Florida and I think, so that's a big state, but it's also, there's a lot of gerrymandering involved and things like that too. So I think, I well, not as much in Florida as in places like Texas, but I think coming from a bigger state um, where you, where, the Republican Party dominates. Um, I think um, I I have a I don't have. It, it makes me feel like it's not like a re my representatives aren't as representative of me as say representatives in a state that aren't gerrymandered, for example. So so um, I'm so I feel like places like. Florida Democrats in Florida aren't getting that representation um, that that other that other states that aren't gerrymandered and think would would receive. Yes, thank thank you for sharing. Appreciate that. And is there anyone else who um, would like to kind of just share based on where they live? and their um, experience. Awesome, Amy. 
we'll get you unmuted, Amy. I don't feel a connection to senators as much as I feel a connection to our congressmen, our, our representatives. I just, I feel that they're more visible. Um, I kind of hold the Senate at arm's length. Um, I've never been, I, I don't know, I, I just, when, when it comes to representative government, I just, I, I tend to look at the House more, I think, and just in my own example. Um, and this book has just really opened my eyes. I, I've always been frustrated by the filibuster, but I never realized quite the extent that it had. And I can see how it's, and I can see why I wouldn't have as much of a connection to the Senate as, as to the House, mm -hmm. as to our local representatives. And Amy, what state are you in? New York, upstate New York, big state. Oh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing your perspective. And I, um, when I, Jamel, I think was the one who submitted this question for us. And, um, and I just finally processed it. And for me, my Senator Ben Sass, you may hear him talk all the time, like, ooh, we need to get back to debating and blah, 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 but he never does it himself. So um, anyway, but Ben Sass, he hasn't had a town hall in Nebraska since 2017. And our rep, even though I'm not a fan of my representative in the house, he has held town halls like, I don't know, he, he actually does a good job. And so I relate to you, Amy, when you talk about um, that connection more to a representative versus the Senate. So thank you for sharing that. All right. Uh, Jamel, I see has a thought thought and go I was ahead. just going to I was just going to share this because I was the the evil genius behind that particular question and it was something that Amy triggered you know where she where she said um you know that that yeah you know, there are more arm's length and reading this book and reading some of the history about it you know it's well they are they're they're not they're not supposed to just be focused on local issues you know, they're supposed to be focused on the national stuff. And that's why the filibuster is particularly galling because with everything that they have to do and that they're responsible for, the fact that they, they can't get stuff through is really, really disheartening. And um, I, I've actually had the chance to meet my Senator and um, I'm from Virginia. And I won't say which senator it was, because you know, I, I, but but he basically <laughs> he basically said he enjoyed being my governor more than he enjoyed being a senator because he felt like he could get done more things done. And that still doesn't give you a clue as to which one it was because both of my senators are former governors of Virginia. Good work. Well, thank you, um, Jamel, for. Jamel had a lot of great questions that we're using tonight, um, which by the way, I'm going to put a little plug in because I'm a teacher. And so I love like putting out opportunities for you all to submit questions or discussion topics. So next uh, week, I hope you click on that little link in the emails and submit a question or two uh, to help, help lift the weight off of Jamel, Jenny, Jana, and I. So we are getting ready to um, head into breakout rooms. Oh, thank you. All right, and I, yeah, I'm gonna mispronounce it, Yana. So you're gonna have to correct me again because I recall seeing you um, last time. I saw your hand raised, so let's get you unmuted. Chana, right? Uh, it's Hana. Hana, I'm sorry. <laughs> I always mess it up too, and I apologize. So Yana was good Here. though. I like that one. That's new. Um, <laughs> you know, reading the 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 book and learning some of the history, some of it I knew, I sort of remembered from school, but just I mean, people fighting duels and you know, I mean, it's just like, are these people nuts? <laughs> But I, I saw that there could be, if it were not distorted and abused as everything is in Washington, 
I really think that there could be some positive things from a filibuster. But I think it is the distortion and corruption and the politicizing. It's no longer about the issue at hand and the validity of the issue. Um, you know, I was fascinated by them getting rid of the previous question rule. Um, I just think that they they found a way, as um, as he said in the book, to just use this um, in a partisan way. So it's not so much that it's a hammer; it's that rather than using it to hammer a nail, they use it to beat somebody's head in. Mm. And and so I think that's the real issue that I saw with it. Thank you. And it's good to have you back too. Good to be here. Thank you. All right. Well, um, as Jamel is wrapping up our breakout rooms, just want to share um, just our norms one more time. Um, so we're going to have three breakout rooms. So, which means we're going to have about 13 uh, ish people in a room. And so again, uh, it kind of just depends on the flow of your room, but if you choose to have your mic um, mics off, uh, just make sure that you know background noise is at a minimum, and that we're making sure uh, a multitude of folks can uh, share their thoughts and perspectives. Um, the breakout rooms are not recorded unless you're going to be in the breakout room with me, and. Um, we just do that so that folks who wanted to join but couldn't uh, still have that opportunity to do so as we upload those on YouTube. And again, let's respect, have respect, create belonging, and have some joy tonight. And then just a reminder uh, that we ask for one volunteer from each group to come back and share highlights as we wrap up our evening tonight. So um, Jamel, are we ready? Jamel, you're muted. So as you get unmuted, just a reminder for breakout rooms, once we open those up, you'll get a little thing that pops up where you'll click join. Um, it's the same if, if it's on your phone. So Jamel. How so we uh, we're looking good. Um, you know, Wes, so I've, I've set up three. Um, I'm in one, uh, Jana is in two, and Jenny is in three. And I'm going to put you in room three as well. Or, or do you put yourself in there, I think? Yeah, uh, I'll put myself in you there. You put yourself in there. OK, I'm going to open the rooms and um, remind people, well, you, you'll see a little button that says you've been invited to join a room. Uh, please click on that. See you soon. Have fun, all. So Wes, I was just talking to them about uh, what their view of the filibuster was kind of before, uh, you know, what we're learning in the book. I think uh, I didn't see the excerpt, uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Did anyone ever kind of see uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington? Yeah. So I always saw it. I was just reflecting how I always kind of saw it as this heroic effort to support something and push it through, you know, uh, kind of thing versus what we're seeing now where it's kind of turned into something that's kind of uh, deadlocked in the American legislative system. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, do we need to... Oh, I think Jacqueline's got something to contribute. You could tell. Yeah. Okay. I, um, I, I don't think that I would have been interested in the book um, at all um, if it were not for the amount of money laundering and international crime that is associated with our government now um, involving Epstein and uh, you know the mob and the, uh, the Russian crime. I mean, it, 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 in Eric Prince and uh, there's so much going on that it shaded for me so much of what goes on in the Senate that there's so much at stake well, there's a part of the book uh, towards the end of the chapter two where he talks about how it used to be so like public 
the reporters used to, this whole discussion was very much on the table and now it's kind of gone into these private committee rooms and it it, it allowed kind of this you know backdoor dealings to kind of occur when before uh, it seemed a lot more transparent than it is now so it's 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 yeah. turned shady it's made politics look even more shady you know and then the author has a connection with harry reed which who i've always respected um and uh, I, I, it was time. I'm trying to be active in Arizona politics. And I, I realized when I made that decision how difficult it really was to start from bottom and all of a sudden say, oh yeah, I'm interested in my state. Let's see what's going on. It's, it's, it's intimidating. There's, there's so much. And so I'm I need to combine, you know, on a federal level and then on the, on the local level because um, it, it, it's so related. And so, yeah, I, and I did see the movie and that had always been my romantic view of Washington, D.C. And I, and I actually knew people who lived in Washington and Republicans and Democrats did eat lunch together and there was a camaraderie, their kids played together. So... I, you know, I wanted to see what this book was because of that. Yeah. Hey, Jan, I see you've got your hand up there. Yes. I'm from Colorado and I'm a member of Indivisible and our state feels very strongly about abolishing the filibuster. And um, we now have two Democratic um, senators, one of which was just elected and he used to be our governor, so we know him very well. And what our group did is we got the books, read them, highlighted them, wrote all kinds of notes in the, um, um, you know, the, the sides of the pages and sent them to, the, to our um, senators. And then we set up meetings with them, audio meetings, in order to discuss it further because we have pretty strong views about how it should be going right about now. And it does seem that it um, is a strong manipulative um, tool for the minority um, parties. And so we, we have a trifecta right now in Colorado as well as in the feds. And we're feeling like this is the time to really strike out and and so this book has been something that we've really paid a lot of attention to in Colorado. That's awesome to hear. And um, I don't even know how we heard of this book and it popped in our laps and we read Stacey Abrams, um, Our Time Is Now, um, which very much focuses on voting rights and um, solid book and so we're really excited to dig deep and so glad Jacqueline and Jan that you both have read this book and you have used what you've learned from the book to advocate to um, your state senators and I think you're you're putting a challenge out there to everyone else for us to do the same um, when it comes to ours. Yana. Well, I haven't read the whole book yet. Oh you're fine I haven't either. <laughs> You know, Wes, one of the things that struck me when I was reading this book, because I've only um, get started getting involved in local politics in the last, well, once uh, 45 got elected. Yeah. And I, I think even at the very lowest levels, like I got elected to a post seat holder position and it's everything from the very Oh, I'm sorry. I think I uh, muted you. Okay, you've been talking to my husband. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like, it's so clickish. You have little groups and they get a little bit of power and you have new people come in and you're trying to help and you got these people who got this little power now and they, and it's just, it's, it's, it's crazy. 
And so when I was reading the book, I really, I'm like, yeah, I understand how the Senate got to where it is, where the cloakroom no longer exists. And they've got these little tiny power bases and these little groups that come together because it starts when they get involved at the very lowest echelons. It's a mentality that is, is fostered at the lowest levels um, of, of, of politics. And so I think that's where the change, it needs to start at the local level. We need more people involved at the local level. We're gonna fight against that, that mentality. You are 100% spot on in every book um, that we have read. We started with Run for Something, Don't Just March, Run for Something by Amanda Littman and a uh, huge advocate of getting involved locally. Um, and then um, Politics is for Power by Aton Hirsch. We read that one where he, um, Aton too advocates for that local power. Um, and the reality is I think in one of the books um, they mentioned that uh, that's where progressives actually don't do well. We focus on the national perspective and then we take time off, you know, until the next four years. So yeah, so uh, really true here. Um, Jenny, do you want to get, I think we did kind of number one. Do you want to yeah. get us on the next one? Yeah, I'm going to post it in the chat too, but I'll read it out to you. Um, Gentleson notes that the framers of the Constitution understood that allowing a minority to block a majority did not promote deliberation, but instead would create temptations to sabotage the majority. Have you ever been in a situation, or can you think of a situation, where requiring more than a majority to proceed, like a supermajority, on an issue is a good thing? Hmm. <laughs> I tried to think of a situation where two thirds is better than the majority. And I had, I was hard pressed to find something. Now they, they set it up. So there were three categories where the supermajority applied impeachment. Uh, if they were going to um, uh, any constitutional amendments and uh, making uh, signing treaties with foreign nations. So, I mean, those are pretty high end kind of things. I would think maybe a supermajority would make sense there. Uh, but, you know, I'm just trying to think in my personal experience, if I've ever had something where, uh, you know, a supermajority was more important than a majority. Uh, also, the author really refers to using the majority's power of persuasion through discussion and that, you know, the majority is still going to have their voice heard. And the fact that um, because we are such a diverse nation with, a, you know, so many people, be, uh, you know, that are voting for the people that are in power, that that would, you know, it's not necessarily that the majority doesn't represent a diverse group of people in a sense. So, uh, but I was trying to think where, what do you think, Wes, if you come across any situations where a super majority would be better? The only time I ever heard of needing a super majority <laughs> is in politics. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to think of a real world example and it's always been the simple majority. Go ahead, Jacqueline. Yeah. I don't know if this is what you're talking about, but um, I have been attending these Zoom meetings with um, Glenn Karshner. Um, who's a lawyer, <clears throat> prosecuting attorney. And um, because, um, because the majority, because um, there's so much suppression in the Senate, uh, in, order to, in order to cut through some of these extremely dangerous pieces of legislation like voter repression and so forth, the legal system that we have is desperately trying to find tools in the courts that haven't been stacked um, and even that have um, to save our democracy. And um, our, our system of law is not prepared for what just happened. So uh, in terms of Trump and um, 
in, in terms of the bullying that has gone on uh, with McConnell, and, and now we have a Supreme Court that is mostly conservative. Um, so I don't know, I, I couldn't understand what you meant by super majority and majority. Mm. Um, okay, so, but what I'm thinking of is that if, 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 the, if you know, if there can't be a debate, um, if there is always this lording over the voices that need to. My understanding from the book is that the minority voice is supposed to have its say in the Senate, and then the public is supposed to listen in and say, gee, you know, that's interesting. Do I agree with that? If I do, I better make my voice heard. So that's, that seems to be gone, and our law is struggling, okay? So I don't know if that addresses anything you said. <laughs> yeah. No, so really what they're, lo they're looking at is, you know, you have your majority vote, which is one more you know, more than half kind of thing, that 50 to 40, you know, 50, oh, 51. And then the supermajority is you have to get the 60 oh, I'm in so order sorry. to pass something. No, that's fine. Um, it, I really, one thing I, I've noticed is, you know, in order for our democracy to work, you have to have that informed electorate. And I think you're alluding to that is open discussion, your constituents will then push back on the elected officials, but we're seeing that, that it's removed from that. It's more closed door. It's not as transparent. There's more suspicion involved. And when you have the senators with six year terms, I don't feel like they need to be as reactive to their constituents um, because they have a longer term. They don't have to like really pay attention in a sense to exactly what their needs are. Uh, but um, you know, it's interesting that you brought the Supreme Court up because they don't work on a super majority. They work on a majority vote. Um, so I just think it's interesting that it applies in this scenario where it's been manipulated uh, to to do this kind of thing. So we are, you know, we are not functioning at our, at the capacity that we need to to function um, with what's going on with the filibuster. Anything Great else? Discussion. Um, well, uh, Janu and Margaret um, made some comments in the chat where they found a situation. Uh, Jury trials. Ah. You know, a jury trial, it has to be, you know, Derek, the Derek, I don't know how to say his last name, Chauvin, Chauvin uh, mm -hmm. case. It, everyone had to, otherwise, boom, trial is hung and it starts all over. So that is uh, one uh, good example. That's there. beyond a super majority. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then you are talking about life or death you know, when it comes to murder convictions and that kind of thing. Uh, so maybe in the case where it is directly related to somebody's life kind of thing, or like the death penalty or, or something like that. Um, even all, all jury trials take unanimous. It has to be, I've served on federal court for, it was a money conspiracy thing. And I never get past the interview stage. I think I'm too opinionated to be selected for a jury. <laughs> They always yeah. catch me on that. Yeah. So, well, awesome. And just a heads up, um, thank you for raising your hands. Since we're in a smaller group, you know, feel free to, you should be able to unmute yourself, you know, so feel free to unmute yourself and just pop in if no one's talking or if Jenny and I are talking, just shout over us and say, hey, oh, hold up, I got a thought here and we'll stop. So, because we want to really have a dialogue uh, here with everyone. So, Jenny, do you have question two? Can you paste that into yeah. the chat? And I'm going to sure, go ahead and go. read it out loud. We are now there headed go, into uh, chapter one, question one. And so Gentleson describes the frustration of not being able to get certain bipartisan uh, support for a popular gun control legislation. Uh, can't even get it to a vote because of the Senate rules. Assuming that rules aren't going to change now that we have a Democratic majority, how can you hold your own senator accountable in situations where they might not allow a vote on popular legislation? So think currently, but also into the future. How could you encourage your senator to allow a vote? Yeah, see, I have two very strong Republican senators in Indiana um, as a, you know, <laughs> we're slowly evolving. So if it came down to like, say, an issue of like gun control background checks, I don't think that they would listen to me. 
it's a, it's a very frustrating situation too. I liked uh, Jan in the um, Janu. I think she's still with us. Where they got the books and sent them over, and Jacqueline, you did that too. You sent like copies of the book to them, <laughs> like you need to read this kind of thing. Well, um, excuse me. Oh, can I talk? Go well, for it. Sure. Uh, Tucson just did something very interesting in terms of the guns. Um, Tucson is more liberal. Phoenix is very conservative. Um, Tucson said, um, well, guess what? We are not going to observe the new state regulation that says that the state of Arizona does not have to observe the federal law. We're still going to do it, so sue us. So there you go, it was a, a brave, uh, very brave, the, you know, Tucson does not yeah. want. So do you uh, think that they, that was because they had a lot of uh, vocal support from their constituents saying, you know, we're gonna stand on our own on this kind of thing? Well, uh, we do have, um, I gotta say, we do have a very strong democratic element in Tucson. Um, they're always at odds with Phoenix and with Bronovich, um, awful attorney general. Uh, and uh, Ducey, who seems to be playing both sides of the fence, who wants to be president and gets a lot of money from Koch, the Koch brothers. Uh, so yeah, I, it, it's a group of people just got, a, got on the city council. There's, there's, a, there's a push in Tucson for people to run for things, to get involved. We have a very strong local democratic party. And that's, that's where local is so important. Oh, listen, yes. uh, it, it, I, can, I can understand it now. Um, I, I get it. Um, I was in Tulsa for a number of years uh, in, in various roles, and I, I did public work. And um, the good old boy system there is just very strong. And I, I can remember when they wanted people to run for office, and I thought, oh, that that would be impossible to do. Now I'm understanding more what that entails. Uh, and more people really need to get involved locally. Yeah. And, you know, Jan, I mean, did you have something you wanted to add? I think I, we cut you off a little earlier. That's okay. I was just saying, I was in a meeting tonight before this started for our state organizing group for Indivisible. When I moved to Colorado 40 years ago, it was Republican state. And then very eventually, it took about 30 years, it started turning purple. We are now blue. And one of the things that Indivisible has done, and it's a new organization since 45, but um, we get on the corners outside of the uh, senators and representatives offices throughout the state. We have our signs about whatever the issue is and hold them up, you know, just like people do when someone's running for an election or something and they hold up their signs. Well, we do it for issues as well. And, um, you know, it's pretty effective. You, you're visible. And um, in Colorado with the gun laws and, and what have you, we've had, I think, more than our share between Columbine and King Supers and Aurora uh, uh, movie theater and what have you. Um, and so it's something that's very forward in our minds, but people don't necessarily carry it over when the ballot is mailed to them. And so it's constantly trying to keep it in the public side, but also in their constituents, because we have turned pretty blue at this point. And it's important to make that that very clear to our, our, rep our representation, as well as it within the state with our local uh, representation. We have um, one gun law right now that's coming up um, this year is where you get a week. If you lose or have your gun stolen, you have one week to submit notification to the state. Um, because, you know, what does everybody say? Oh, somebody stole my gun. It wasn't me that used it. So, trying, you know, little by little trying to peck away at some of the issues that stand out um, in people's minds. Yeah. 
That's good. Holding them accountable and remembering where they voted on something, not forgetting, never forgetting kind of thing. And um, Well, and trying them. to do it before they vote. Yeah. You know, it's like the vote's coming up, folks. And this is what we think. Mm -hmm. And usually the opposition isn't out there doing the same thing. So what and we've seen a lot of states flip to blue, like Colorado, Virginia did it. Uh, yeah. You know, we're seeing Georgia. it happen. Yeah, I look, I'm in Indiana and I look at it like, oh, we're just never going to get there. Like, how are we even going to get out from this hole that we're in? But, uh, you know, there's hope out there the more you learn. So that's yeah. that's great. Yeah. Wes, did you want to go on to the, the next question or? Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think, um, you know, Jan, I think be invisible. And unfortunately, we can't get to D.C. all the time. Or mm -hmm. not at all, you know, um, yep. but you can be visible whether um, it's on social media, you know, um, tagging your uh, senator or whatnot, um, but then also emails and phone calls. Um, postcards. I, yeah, postcards, mm -hmm. even just sending a postcard saying, boom. Um, and then one, one thing that a activist here in Nebraska has done is, I mean, it's not often, but when our senators in Nebraska who have been Republican for quite some time, when they actually vote a way that they like, they, then they also make sure to also let them know on those things as well, um, not just on- That they're not their representing their constituents, is that what you're saying? They're um, voting- just, Yeah, like, well, um, they just, uh, whether the um, senator votes in a way that they like or, or dislike, they always try to reach out in all circumstances um, because that they have found that when they do reach out on positive, um, in positive times, um, that's that can build a rapport um, yeah. versus just always contacting um, when you dislike what they do. But yeah. it's hard to find one if you live in a very red state and are blue. It's sometimes hard to find those moments where you are like, yay, good job. But, you know, <laughs> they are there sometimes. So because um, I've been, I've been, like I said, I don't know if you all know who Ben Sass is. Um, oh, yeah. But uh, he has been someone who he loves the history and traditions and whatnot. I mean, he's huge on it. And he's he, he wishes the Senate was about debating and truly getting back to that roots. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to craft how I could have a dialogue with him, but I really love what you and Jacqueline did. And I know he's a reader, so I might just, might just mail him a copy of my book. Mm -hmm. We're well done. <laughs> so. Well, and I think that having um, collective organization helps a lot too, because then it's not just you. You know, you've got a group of people who are all representing the same thing. So he's getting information from other folks as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. And Indivisible does some good work. So glad you're connected, Jan. And if the rest of us aren't, I uh, highly suggest you looking and seeing if there is a local Indivisible group near you that you could get up, become a part of as well. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Jenny, do you want to um, do you want to paste that one in and I'll read it again? Yeah, sure. Here's the yeah. next question. So in chapter one, a detailed history on <laughs> the early days of Congress in the Senate and really what the framers of the Constitution, um, their thoughts on majority rule, because we often hear about the filibuster, the saying is, oh, it's here to protect the minority. So obviously we're a divided nation right now. And, but what similarities or differences do you um, think there are between the concept of majority rule and minority rights? Um, and when we compare that to back in the 1700s, 1800s to what we are experiencing and living today. What, um, so what, what, what things are you seeing personally um, that are similar, but also different? The South is still the South. And the <laughs> South is still fighting today for the same thing it fought for 
during the Civil War and during the, you know, when the framers were going through these conversations, the, the South is about white superiority and white power and the, the ability of white men to control the lives and destinies of everybody. That's where the South is. And they call it um, conservatism, but it's racism and it's misogyny and it's all the things that it's always ever been. So there's no difference. To me, it's a, it's a, a difference with, it's a distinction without a difference is, is, is what it is to me. I don't, you know, after listening to all of that, it, uh, I, I listened to the audiobook. <laughs> So, you know, to me, it was like, it's the same, you know, it's the same war, just different nomenclature. So it's not voter suppression, it's doing it in the Senate kind of thing. Right. Um, but it's the end, the end goal is still the same, a minority of people, physically of people, uh, that are trying to control the majority because they are losing power. Stacy talks about that in her Our Time Is Now book about it's all about power, the su voter suppression, and of course what the Senate is doing. Um, and if you look at the number of people that they're really representing, you know, I think they were, he was talking about the gun control back in, uh, you know, Sandy Hook times. It was like they represented 34% of the population. They're not representing, uh, you know, a most of the population. I noticed that the, the Biden administration really brings this up quite a bit about how they have bipartisan support. The people support this. The people want it. What they're really trying to show is that difference between we represent the people, you are representing yourselves in a way. Uh, but I, I still, I, I do see that there's just this small, small minority of people that whether they hold uh, land resources back when the, the framers were, were doing this, or now it's like the Koch brothers with large money donations. It's kind of the same people are pulling the strings kind of thing. Um, but I think the big difference is, is the amount of money that, that these people are contributing to the population. It used to be that the slave hole, you know, the South was contributing a lot, so they needed fair representation. Uh, but it's now the economy, um, you know, if we looked at it more of like who is contributing tax wise, who deserves the representation, uh, it would be, I think, of a totally different system now uh, with not just two senators automatically from each state uh, because it's it's unequal to what they're actually contributing to the economic base of the, the, the country. So, yeah. And yeah. I thought it was interesting in the book when they talked about Madison and his whole push because he was very concerned about the minority not getting heard, such as Delaware, um, and that that's how the two chambers ended up being created was to try and neutralize that by having one chamber by population and the other chamber by state, so that hopefully it would sort of wash the out in the middle. Yeah. yeah. The checks and balances of the whole thing. I have to say with the past four years, I, I, we survived, I feel, that administration because of the checks and balances that uh, are in place. It, it worked kind of thing. Uh, so yeah. I was very proud of how things kind of held up under that attack of 45's administration. And I think the other thing I keep seeing on Facebook and places we need to have um, limitation on um, terms. And it's like, if we did that, we would not have survived 45 mm. presidency. We need to have people with experience, with um, guts relationships and guts and mm -hmm. understanding um, foreign policy because they've been through it. I mean, my state has limited um, terms for everything in the state. And I don't think it's very efficient or very effective because you're constantly having, well, part of it depends on how many, you know, um, terms you would get, but we're constantly having to train and teach new people because they're not in, in their seat for very long. 
And I'm afraid if we had that at the federal level, it would be horrible. What we really need are educated electorates so people know what they care about and then seek out people that represent what their issues are and that they be educated people when they're at, you know, filling out their ballots. Yeah, um, Wes, Wes yeah. made a good point here in the notes about, in the book, it says, Madison said, trust the system. And the system, mm -hmm. the system saved America, in my opinion, uh, yeah. so much so that we're kind of, you know, in the situation we're in now, thank goodness, so. Yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, true, Wes. Has a term limit. He can only serve two terms. And so to have people sitting in the Senate for yes. else and for they, 30 years, yeah, they get entrenched like uh, the turtle man up there and causing all of these problems. You know, uh, Mitch McConnell has been a thorn for a very, very long time. And so, you know, I people can build relationships over a period of time, but I think that you get to a point where you know, like it says in the Bible, you got to get the accursed thing out of the camp so that the people can move forward. Some people are blocking our progress. I mean, Mitch McConnell wouldn't even let bills come out of committee. Yeah. They got hung up in committee. Very frustrating. Very <laughs> frustrating. So, and not what are the beauty of our Constitution and what the framers wanted. There was always this good spirit in good spirit. Uh, you know, we saw that completely go out, you know, letting people debate an issue, we didn't even get an opportunity to talk over and debate or, or publicize what was being discussed. Uh, so all those years we've been sitting there feeling it's been ineffectual so that eventually people don't trust the system. And it's easier for it to be kind of sabotaged, uh, like it was with the 45 administration. So yeah. Yeah, I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way, but it was a conversation my husband and I had when Sandy Hook happened. When Sandy Hook happened and there were no gun control laws, my husband walked in my studio and he said, I'm telling you, we're in trouble because anytime a man can walk into school and gun down first grade white kids and the white guys in Washington don't react, by putting laws in place. He said, look at the difference between how they responded to the oxycodone situation. You know, all of a sudden we needed all these new rules about how doctors could dispense, you know, drugs and the whole nine thing. But this dude killed those beautiful, beautiful souls. And those people sat in Washington, the Republicans sat in Washington and they would not respond. Yeah, it was heartbreaking because yeah. if there was any time in our history we were gonna do something about it, that was the time we were called to. Uh, Janu, I see you have your hand raised. Oh, let me hit you, unmute for you. Are you with us still? Jenny, let me I didn't oh. wanna leave that out there like that. I'm just saying our country has changed the politics and the feelings of the people who govern us are different than they've ever been. These mm -hmm. people uh, don't have the same moral love. compass. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. they don't love this country. I think the way politicians in the past, even if they were corrupt, I mean, like Richard Nixon had enough dignity and enough to resign and step, I mean, he, he his guys looked at him and said, dude, you got to go. And he, and he left. And these guys, they just, it's not in them. Yeah, it's shocking at times. It's shocking. And we have to remind them of that. It's important that we, we remind them that they need to protect. And it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's heartbreaking at times. Yeah. Go ahead, Janu. Yeah, hey, can you guys hear me? Yeah. I just wanted to say two things. One is, I think you were talking about trusting the system. Um, I think, I, I, from my point of view, I think it's short-sighted. I think, yeah, I think it was a well-designed system, the American democracy, or, you know, the, what they, the founders thought, but 
but any system that's more than 200 years old, I think is out of date. And even so well-intentioned it was, I think every facet of it has to be re-examined. I mean, from electoral college, the, the filibuster, the, I think everything, whatever the, the situation where we are is not what the situation was when the United States was founded. So yes, I, I think the whole thing has to be re-examined from nuts to bolts, from local elections to the electoral college and everything is, that's why I feel like even though you said the system held, I think we barely held it. It was yeah. breaking at the edges. I mean, just a little push and shove and the whole thing would have collapsed, I think. Yeah, yeah. it was elastic, but boy, there were times we were sweating it for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, like you're saying, that the, the place and time that they decided this and put these structures in place, our, our moral framing, our moral you know, our attitudes about women voting and slavery and things like that, we're at a, in a totally different place than they are right now. Uh, so democratic reform, I think in order to evolve, we need to yeah. make sure that we're paying attention to that. Very good points, Janu. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Hi, Jacqueline. I think, I think continuing to tell them we're shocked is pointless. Um, I think I heard Gentleson on MSNBC saying that he's actually afraid that if we do that the if we do not get rid of the filibuster, we will lose our democracy. He said, and I I, I honestly think that um, um, we have to look at at people in the Senate. What's going on now with um, uh, McConnell and Cruz and um, Lindsey Graham? The obvious um, disregard for anything, whether it's logic, morals, ethics, common sense, they don't care. There's something in it for them that's more important. Mm. And um, they're criming. Yeah. They, they, so so um, I see Democrats sometimes um, congratulating themselves on, on good deeds and uh, doing the right thing. And um, we're beyond, in my opinion, we're way beyond that now. Um, we need to have the law work really hard and really fast um, because it, this, it, you know, he's in Mar-a-Lago doing what he does. I mean, I'm sure he hasn't stopped calling his dictator friends. Um, this is global. This is a global issue now. And um, America's still powerful. Yeah, we, I think that's why we've seen so, so much happen in the first 100 days of this administration. Um, and why, you know, uh, Biden wasn't my primary choice, but he's the right fit for this time right now with his years of experience. Uh, and the people he knows and the resources he can pull upon and, and that kind of thing is, is you're right, we have to be forewarned and careful. Um, I think we have a few minutes left. Do we want to post one more question, Wes? Yeah, and I think- about five? Yeah, yeah, let's do chap- Yeah, we got about five minutes. So um, chapter two, question one. I sh and I think yeah. this is a good segue into what Janu said, um, you know, about mm -hmm. anything 200 years old needs reformed. As we read chapter two, we- get introduced to norms and precedents being changed. And so as you were reading that, was there any norms or precedents that you, that we learned about that occurred in the Senate that you feel should return? Or do we need to completely just boom, start over? And you can all just unmute yourself and stop. I know people have their hand raised, but I don't know if you didn't pull them down or whatnot. I'd like to say something. I'd like to say something about the norms. Um, I've done some thinking about this. I can't say that I've thought it out all that in, in detail, but the norms and the precedents are ruled by the same rules or whatever as anything else. It's like once Trump started lying and lying became totally acceptable and there was nothing to stop him from lying, what stops him from lying in the future? A norm for me would be you don't lie, yeah. you know, but he got away with it. And so now everybody's going to get away with it. And I don't know how you 
put that genie back in the bottle. I really don't. Um, that's why this book is interesting to me that Calhoun started at such an early time to erode things. And I'm sure he wasn't the only one. And it, the book started out by saying that he had some respect and that he did believe in the minority rights being controlled, but then he switched once it started to affect his state and his the slavery in his state and you know the economics in his state. And that crux of like when he switched, what went on in his head intrigues me. And not that I'll ever figure that out, but I, it's like I'm thinking, what makes a person go off the edge like that? And I think that we see that with the Republicans, that Republicans, it's like Jacqueline was talking about, you know, they don't care. They all, they have some goal in mind. I can't quite figure out what it is. I mean, I know what we all say it is, but it's like, really, is that it? Is it about the, the misogyny, the racism, the economics? Is it really that? Or are these people like devils? I mean, I'm not like a religious person. So I like, it's not like I necessarily believe in the devil, but there's something very sinister about the, it's almost as if they're all brainwashed or something. It's and, bewildering at times. Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah. Always about, it's always about money. It's yeah. always about money. And, and, and besides that, our, our times, we need different norms now. We have global warming. We didn't have global warming back then. We have an enormous, uh, diverse population. We didn't have that back then. There are so many things that have changed since that time that the norms have to change. The young people are, have different concerns. Um, but how do you get everybody to agree on the norms if you've got people you know, who really don't care about those things? I think you, you protect the process so that the norms can emerge. Mm -hmm. So that if there is debate, the minority can be heard. And if it's about global warming and a majority of people want uh, things done about global warming, then it's not blocked because it can't be blocked. That's how, that, for me, that's how norms change. But, but you, you take the filibuster, you take someone like McConnell, whose only goal uh, is, is control. And I mean, his, his uh, thank goodness he didn't get that aluminum plant from Russia built in his state. Uh, and the people in his state are not getting from him what they need anyway. This, this torture of people, the, the low enough wage so that you can't feed your family, it, it, it's ridiculous. So it's, it's, it's pure torture now. And I think the norm will come. You know, the majority has always won the election, right? But the, but the Republicans get in the office because of the Electoral College. We need change, has to be change. Yeah, and I think they have to hold each other accountable when they're not. There's such a minority in the Republican Party that's holding the majority of, of Republicans that are pulling this these bad faith acts that aren't able to call them out. It used to be, you know, society kind of self-regulates what's appropriate and what isn't. And there's a disconnect that's occurring where people, you know, and honestly, they, I don't think the people that are making these decisions think they're bad people. They have a reason that is completely valid to them as to why they're willing to not have gun control and let people be shot. You know, there's a, there's a bigger picture to them that they feel that it embraces. But yeah, um, a couple of things that were popped up was bring back the vice president presiding over the Senate routinely, not just in special instances. I think that would be really cool because that's an elected official. I thought that was great. Um, and gerrymandering is the big issue. And a lot of this stuff I think refers back to those local offices that are going to make those decisions that are gonna filter up. But yeah, we would love to see VP Harris go up there and show them how it's done kind of thing, so. <laughs> and, and I think you sure. know, for me, yeah as a teacher um you know th this has really changed my mind on how i'm going to teach um you know majority rule minority rights was something i would always talk about and then like how the senate does that and everything but this book i think really like we had to share what we've learned with our fellow democrats and progressive friends because as people said earlier in our whole group is 
most people just assume what Mr. Smith goes to Washington is, is the filibuster, you know, and we are here for a reason because we're probably politically active to some degree, <laughs> uh, you know, compared to most folks who just go and vote, you know, every two, four years. So we got to take what we've learned from this and share it and not only share it with our elected officials, but share it with fellow activists and folks who care, because if it just sticks with us, it's no good. So I, I mean, that's one thing I have learned. Um, and I love Jacqueline, I think you said protect the process, um, different norms for new issues. And as John, you talked about and Jenny, like that's the history of America. We have always changed. Um, so norms and precedent, yeah, that's, norms and precedent never work. That's the beauty of our institution through amendments and whatnot. It's, we've always changed and adapted. And if we don't, it's gonna get worse. And I think how I love that protect the process because that speaks uh, kind of towards Republican conservative traditional thinking. Mm -hmm. um, when we say get rid of the filibuster, because we want to protect the process, because the process is already there. There's the House, there's the Senate, then it goes to the president, then it goes to the courts. Like, let's all get on the same page and protect the process, which I think really will speak, I think, to that traditional conservative mind frame. Um, How, however, really quickly, Wes. Yeah, go for it. You, know, you look at protecting the process when Obama was president and wanted to, and proposed somebody for the Supreme Supreme Court, <clears throat> there was the majority in the Senate, and we didn't even have a chance. They would not even consider it. They just shut it down. And yep. that part of the process is not okay. And of course, McConnell sat on, I think it was 400 um, different statutes that were being presented by the House. He never presented them to the Senate at all during the last um, two years of the of, Obama's um, ter last term. I mean, that stinks. Jan, um, there was a, the prosecutor in DC, uh, Kushner, uh, uh, says that, <clears throat> not Kushner. Um, I was going to say Glenn what? Kirshner, Glenn <laughs> Kushner said that there is a, uh, there was a legal process that Obama could have used um, to, to get that, um, to get uh, Garland on the Supreme Court and he didn't go for it because I don't because obviously he didn't understand that it was that serious back then so yeah um, but we do have law 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 backs us up our, our to, allow, to allow the majority leader of the Senate to just put bills in a trash can essentially for two running years and not present them to his his peers that's not a good. That's not a good process. So I think that what was said earlier about we have to continually review the processes and look at what doesn't work now. And because of technology, a lot of things have changed, and the ability to do things differently exists yeah. far from the way it was with our framers. All right. Well, it is good to see everyone's faces. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that smaller, more intimate opportunity to converse over um, the, for this first part of Adam's book. And so we're gonna take time to just hear, and I gotta stress this enough because we are, um, we are about eight minutes away from when uh, it is time for some folks on the East Coast probably to get ready for bed and the rest of us to uh, finish the rest of our day. So if we could keep your highlights to like one minute max, all right, uh, just so that we can hear from everyone and get about the rest of our evening. So um, Jamel, we had you in room one. Um, so whomever was the uh, spokesperson for your group, uh, let's get them unmuted. And Jamel, if you could let me know who it is or, uh, oh, Kaz, boom. <laughs> hey, so I'll try and keep it, try and keep it short. Um, we had a great discussion. Um, I really liked the part where we were talking about um, 
the, the rules and regulations of, of the Senate um, that make it so now that we don't actually have to do the filibuster, right? They don't have to actually stand there and do the 13 hour filibuster anymore. And they had a discussion on why. And um, Wendy pointed out that, um, Wendy and Constance pointed out that it's about, you know, we no longer have good, um, good faith um, conversations and debate anymore. It's showing that, um, that uh, it's conceding that, that debate no longer changes people's votes. And what does that mean, right? So then it points to a bigger issue that rather not just filibuster in general, but if debate and conversation can no longer change votes, then, you know, so, so yeah, that was an interesting part of the, of the conversation that we had. Awesome. Uh, I really like that. What, what is the bigger issue in our society and government? Very nice. All right, um, Jana has informed me that Amy is the rep for room two. Good job, Kaz. I think you made it to a minute or less. I'm not timing you all, but Amy, we'll get you unmuted. I think you are. Okay, all right. I, um, I first wanna thank our facilitator and all of the women. I think we were all women. Um, it was a very engaging discussion um, revolving around a few central themes. One, that the book is really eye-opening. We were lacking in knowledge. We lacked the knowledge of the actual, the, the power of the filibuster, and we appreciate the lucidity of, of the author. Um, and then we got into, you know, the realization of the lack of cohesion seemingly today vis-a-vis in the days of the framers, but then we came back to the theme that in the days of the framers, not everyone was represented um, to begin with. And so is it is it kind of an equi a, a, a kind of equivalency, but the norms in the past, we have gotten away from. And that brought us to a discussion of what we do about the gridlock um, and the lack of cohesion um, and what concrete measures we might look at in terms of getting deadbeat senators not elected, being informed, looking at the financial angle of incumbency. We got some interesting statistics about the, um, the sheer financial angle of incumbency that perpetuates these career politicians. Um, and then we... Um, we just came back to, you know, more and more brainstorming on what we could do. So, um, and the other aha is the, is the realization how the filibuster was born out of white supremacy and slavery and that that, that was a, a piece of information that was new for a lot of people. So hopefully I captured everything that we, that we talked about. It was a really good discussion. Good work, Amy. Um, and uh, you, I just want to respond real quick to um, just uh, your comment on how much people learned and what new information we've gleaned through tonight and through reading the book. And what we, I challenge um, my room with is it can't just stay with us. You have to start sharing and talking about this with fellow progressives and Democrats who are active in your communities. Because as many of you shared, you learned a lot in just these first uh, three parts of the book. And you're here for a reason because you probably care about politics more than the average American. And so we have to share what we've learned with others if we truly want to see something different. And for Liz and I, probably changing how we teach about certain subjects in our classrooms uh, as well. So thank you for that, Amy. All right, and then um, group, group three, Jenny and I, uh, Jacqueline and Jan are going to uh, get us our quick review. So Jacqueline, I think I asked to unmute you and Jan, I'll get you unmuted as well. Jacqueline, give your 30 second highlight. Okay, I think our group was so intense, we needed two people. <coughs> um, <coughs> A lot of us had ignorance about the filibuster. Uh, we talked about white male supremacy and uh, the need to keep hold on to money. 
changing norms and how the world is changing. We have to change the norms in the Senate and really uh, protect the process and get the process cleaned up. Uh, global warming technology. The Republicans are toxic and actually don't care to work to change things for the better. Um, somebody wanted the VP presiding over the Senate. I love that idea. And um, uh, I'm impressed that people can teach kids this or somehow disseminate this. I think that's important. Okay, I don't know if I covered everything. It was a wonderful group. Thank it you, was. Jackson. Go and ahead, I think one of the things that was really especially meaningful to me was a comment made by one of our, I think our only man in our group other than Wes. And that was, you know, anything that's 200 years old certainly needs to be looked at and adjustments made because things aren't the same as they were 200 years ago. An example was the electoral college, gerrymandering, filibuster. I mean, it just goes on and on and on with different things with um, the government as it was framed, but ultimately the power of the framers and what they put together is what holds us together. And I think Jenny used the word elastic that, you know, mm -hmm. it just, it, it kind of stretches here and there now, but ultimately I think we all agreed that it was important that we start looking at these issues and that that's where the norms came <laughs> in with how do we incorporate all of that together? Thank you, Jan. Appreciate it. And um, and I think too, um, I'll just add, like we, we cannot forget the racist history our country was built on. And the filibuster is part of that story. And um, and that that is the, sin, the ugliest sin of America. And until we continue to address it and knock down everything that um, that sin uh, creates, um, because building bridges is about racial equity, and you can't have racial equity when the very systems of government are still operating under its racist ways of the past. So I just want to allude to that. Jacqueline, I see your hand raised. Um, if you could, could you put your comment in the chat for us? Because I got to wrap up here. Thank you so much. Um, I am going to share my screen here just because Building Bridges, we do more than just a book club. There's many ways for you to get involved wherever you are in the country. Uh, I think the pandemic showed us the beauty of connecting and creating belonging and action in virtual spaces. And so all progressives are, are welcome regardless of where you are in that political spectrum. Um, and so how can you get involved? I just wanna give you a real quick next week uh, professor Sierra Torres Spellacy uh, is a professor at Stinson University College of Law. She's also a Brennan Center Fellow. Will be joining us for a Q&A tomorrow for the first 30 minutes. And then, as it has been mentioned, Adam Gentleson, the author of Kill Switch, will be joining us on our last date. We have a few other guests already. Um, we got one guest that was locked in earlier this week as well. So that's exciting. And we're working on one more for that final week. But other ways you can get involved. We have mobilized events to take action. On Wednesdays, we watch movies. And as we watch movies, you can write postcards. And then on Sundays, we play various games uh, that are fun. Like last week, it, this past Sunday, it was categories. Um, and then there's also times for chit chat and postcard writing. And then every other Friday, letters for a cause. Next week, not this Friday, they'll be writing to encourage uh, the passage of the Equality Act. And currently, we are writing postcards for Cammie Watkins. Special shout out because I'm hoping that she one day is my next city council member here in Omaha, Nebraska. So we always like to support local candidates running for local office. And then it's April's a long month, so there were five Thursdays, so there's nothing happening this week, but there's four different ways where you can get trained on how to be a grassroots organizer, how to use your story to unlock your political power, how to pop that disinformation bubble, because there sure is a lot of disinformation just about 
fill the, the filibuster, let alone every other issue our country's going through. And then another uh, training on say this, not that, because the reality is how we say things really does make a difference when we're talking with friends, colleagues, neighbors on, on whether or not they're going to even give that message a chance. So we hope you take advantage of those upper opportunities. We hope that you come back next week. In case you didn't know, um, with Mobilize, you have to sign up every week in order to get that Zoom link. And so I will make sure to include the registration link in our follow-up email. We'll also share a recording um, of our conversation as well. Give us a follow on social media. We're on pretty much all the major platforms. And uh, again, we just appreciate you coming here tonight. And one thing that this is my favorite part of book club is at the very end, we give permission for everyone to unmute themselves so we can all say goodbye. And um, I think you all can unmute yourselves now. So Thank you for joining Bye, us. Everybody. We'll see you Thank next you. time. Bye. Thank you so much.